Just saying. Good. What's that? Wait till next week. We're running over. All right. Good evening. We are. Y'all ready to finish up First John? Come close. Maybe. Before I do that, I got a couple of questions. The study guides. Do y'all want me to continue them, or you just want to break a piece of paper and take a note? Be honest. Tell me what you want. I like it. Yeah, I, like I do. It. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I concur. <laughs> we have a concurrence. Um, we'll either finish or come close to finishing first chapter five tonight. When I finish that, we'll do second John, then third John. And since we're doing all of John's writings, I figured why not do the Gospel of John? Okay. Any arguments? No. Nope. Nope. All right. Everybody got their little pieces of paper? We'll get rolling. Uh, Is there a new one back there? Yes, ma'am. For, uh, for chapter 5. It's very often the case that children follow in their parents' footsteps. You hear statements of, like father, like son, or she's just like her mother. In addition, children often bear a striking resemblance uh, to one, if not both, of their parents. People will say they're the splitting image of their mom or dad, or she or he has their father or mother's eyes, nose, chin. I remember our son Kyle had a little dimple in his chin. Well, I don't have one. Paula doesn't have one. Where did this come from? We were at her parents. Her dad, I think, was holding him, and I looked and said, that's where it comes from. Her dad had a little dimple. Anyway, in the letter of 1 John, this last living apostle has repeatedly drawn attention to three overarching birthmarks of a child of God. The doctrinal mark, you have the right belief. The moral mark, you have the right love. And the ethical social mark, that you have the right behavior. I'll leave it at that. Uh, so as we begin chapter 5 this evening, John draws out the necessary implications of these three birthmarks, doctrinal, moral, ethical, social, and highlights six specific identifying evidence that an individual that is that an individual is a child of God, that we are children of God. John wants true believers to be assured they are children of God, as the Gnostic belief had crept into the church and was changing the gospel message of Christ and deceiving. Remember, you saw that back in 2.6. John writes to provide for all believers, including us today, rock-solid assurance that they have been born again, that they belong to Jesus, and that they can enjoy right now the gift of eternal life. He writes in 5.13, know you have eternal life. Did you know you have eternal life? You're not going to gain eternal life. It's not a matter of waiting. You've got it right now. And this is John's point, main point, probably here in this chapter. So let's dive in. 5 1. He says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. So, whoever, the Greek word, if I pronounce this right, y'all correct me if I'm wrong, genomea, is defined as all or every. Hence, no one's left out. So when he says whoever, nobody's left out. Whoever believes. There's no limitations. It's not whoever believes as a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or whoever lives in this hemisphere, or has, you know, or it's over five foot, under five foot. Whoever. For God so loves the world, you know, that's everybody. And so that's what he means here. Or the Greek meaning is everybody. Nobody's left out. So whoever believes has faith, meaning has confidence or conviction that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. John's point. You place your faith in Jesus, you're born again. That's the phrase we use. No doubt about it. 
he adds, whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. So all born again Christians. Now, that same verse in the contemporary English version, which is a very simple translation written for, I think, eight-year-olds, if I remember right. If we believe Jesus is truly Christ, we are God's children. Everyone who loves the Father will also love his children. Already got that? Makes sense, right? We're not eight-year-old, but we can understand it. So, remember who John's writing against. False teachers that have crept into the church and tried to deceive those that are in there or lead them away. And he's saying, no, you believe you're a child of God. All right, let's look at uh, two and three. By this, he says, we know. Now, you're going to see a lot of no's in this chapter. Not N-O, but K-N-O-W. By this, we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. By this. What's the this? What's the this that he's talking about in that verse? Love. Love of God. Is it? We believe that Jesus is the Christ. It's going back to verse 1. The this is whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ. You're born again. You love the Father. You love everybody else. So by that fact is what he's saying. By this, we are all born again children of God. That, by that. So what are we as believers? What are we to know? We have eternal life. I don't remember reading that, but I mean, it's true. God's commandments. We're, we are to know God's commandments and that love. We are to love other children of God because we love God and observe his commandments. Okay? So John writes, this is the love of God. What is God's love? Or what is the love of God? What is the love of God according to what John just wrote? Those two verses. He loves the children of God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Love God. God. And? Observe his, his commandments. I had about three voices at once. <laughs> Sorry. I know I have two ears, but I can't hear but one at a time. Who said what? His commandments. His commandments. Yeah. You look there, verse uh, verse 2. We know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Are his commandments burdensome, heavy, troublesome, oppressive, difficult? Worrisome? Are they? No. Why not? Hmm? Why aren't they burdensome? We wouldn't be able to hold to them. Some people would say they are. If you love God, you shouldn't be. No. Shouldn't be. It's pretty simple to understand. Okay. Does the world agree with them today? <laughs> Very few. Remember, Jesus says. Uh, my yoke is not heavy. What's a yoke? Anybody know? Some of you farmers. What's a yoke? Like a collar. Yeah. It yoked two animals side by side. So if it's Jesus' yoke, and we're yoked to it, who are we yoked to with? Jesus, Jesus right? Ain't going to be part of some if he's pulling the, uh, part of the load, right? He's right there with us the entire time. So how is a believer able to keep God's commandment, keep his word? It is by the fact that we're given what? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Believe in Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. That's how we're able to keep his word, to keep his commandments, to even understand his word as far as that goes. So how does it make you feel to know you can keep all of God's commandments and not be weighed down. How does it make you feel? It makes you feel good. It should. <laughs> you know, 
There are people who go, well, I can't be a Christian yet because, bottom line is, I'm having too much fun and I don't want to be weighed down. Does being a Christian mean you don't have fun anymore? I, I, I must have messed up if that's the case. Yeah. But that's how some people see it. But you got to follow all these rigid rules, no? They break it away because it's not allowed. Yeah, I, it's, it doesn't work that way. So then what's the key commandment of God that we're supposed to keep? What's Love. his key commandment? Love. 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 All right, Jesus said, John 13, 34, 35, the new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, so that you also love one another. By this, all men will know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So how do people know we are a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ? We get it tattooed across our forehead? <laughs> it's how we live, right? Showing God's love towards others, whoever they might be. Uh, then we see in 1 John 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So we're born again. We know God, therefore we're to love. Because that's the commandment. Remember, Jesus said when asked, what's the first uh, greatest commandment? Love who first? Uh, love who second? Maybe. If you do those two things the way God loves us or Christ loves us, you're not going to break any of the Ten Commandments, will we? No. We'll keep them all just fine. All right, let's look at verse 4. Um, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Overcome is understood as to conquer or to prevail. So you are born of God, you prevail, you overcome the world. The victory that has helped us to prevail, to conquer the world is our faith. So to, it's to be under, we're to understand this, that it's a habit that one has that enables us to overcome the world by faith. Remember back uh, when he was talking, he says it was the practice, the habitual habit that you practice this or you practice that. You practice being angry. You practice being a drunkard. You practice uh, uh, deceiving people. Instead of making a habit of living with God's love in you and loving others because you know the love of God. It's, it's the habit that we make. The world, it would, uh, some scholars say John is speaking of the false teachings of the Antichrist who suggest Jesus is not the Son of God and did not come in the flesh Hence, that society, hence, what society says is pushed on us. Society trying to push anything on us today? No? What's society trying to force down, uh, push on us? Gay marriages. All their sins. Sin, yeah. We could just sum it up that way. Society says accept this sin. And if you speak out against it, you know, they attack you. Yep. Which is why you got believers that do this. Well, it, it's not affecting me. You know one of the greatest sins? Sin of silence. We, we say nothing. I forget where it is. Uh, I think it's in Paul's writings. He says, if you say nothing, you're agreeing with it. There's a lot of churches out there, pastors included, that are saying nothing. They're agreeing with what society is trying to push on us. They'll answer for us. We'll all answer for our actions. Um, yeah, all right. 
Verse 5. Who is the one who overcomes the world, but he who believes Jesus is the Son of God? So again, he's reinforcing his teachings concerning belief in Christ Jesus. The true believer will develop a habit of overcoming, conquering the world as they believe in Christ as God's only begotten Son in the flesh, not spirit only, which is what the Gnostics or false teachers had been teaching. Uh, John 16, 29, 33, a couple of verses that talk about overcoming. Uh, his disciples said to him, said to Jesus, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and not using a figure of speech. Now we know you know all things and have no need of, uh, for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you have come from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered each to his own home and to leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Anybody here not have tribulation in this world? I want your secret. <laughs> you know, some of us have more tribulation than others, or hard times, however you want to call it, bad luck. But Christ has already overcome that. Doesn't mean because we believe that we're not going to have tribulation, or life's going to be smooth sailing. It just means you're yoked to him, and it's he'll pull you through. Romans 12, 21 do not over, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The world will say, I'm going to get even, right? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That might be one scripture that uh, some people who haven't set foot in church their entire life might know. Because they want to get even. They want to get ahead. They want to get whatever will make them feel better and do better for them. Do good. We're to do good, whatever they may do. Uh, and then 1 John 12, 13, 14, John says, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you children because you know the father. I've written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. And I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. How do we overcome? By faith. It's not a matter of, well, if I go to the gym and work out and build up muscles, I can, no. We can't do it. Jesus has already done it for us. You look at verse, uh, verse 6. This is the one, well, my Christ now, who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with water and with blood. It is the Spirit, notice that's capitalized, reference to the Holy Spirit, who testifies because the Spirit is true. Water is a reference to when Jesus began his ministry, when he was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. Blood is when Jesus ended his earthly ministry with his shed blood at the crucifixion. Serenthus lived from 50 to 100 A.D. and was an early Gnostic. He denied that the supreme God made the physical world. In Serenthus' interpretation, the Christ, only in spirit form, descended upon Jesus at baptism, guided him in mystery and the performing of miracles, but left him or directly before the crucifixion. This is one thing he taught. He was a false teacher. He's saying Jesus was just a regular human being that came to John the Baptist, and when he's baptized, remember John South says, I see a dove coming down from heaven and descended. Well, the Holy Spirit came. And at that moment, Jesus was possessed, for lack of a better word, by the Holy Spirit. And that's what enabled him to heal people and do the miracles that he did 
But before he died on the cross, the Spirit left him. Sound good? It wasn't really God in human form, was it? And he really, God would not have really known what it's like to be a human so that he could relate to us. Early Christian tradition describes Serenthus as a contemporary to and, and an opponent of John the Evangelist, who wrote 1 John and 2 John and 3 John, uh, to warn the less mature in faith and doctrine about the changes that Serenthus was making to the original and only gospel. According to the early Christian sources, the Apostle John wrote his gospel specifically to refute the teachings of Serenthus. You know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they were all written like in about a 20-year time period. Like from about, I'll say, 60 to 60s, 70s AD. Well, John didn't write his like 20 years later, around 90 AD. And John is written in a different aspect or a different viewpoint than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He focuses more on really the last week of, of Christ's life where they focus on his entire ministry because this is why he's writing because false teaching has already crept into the church within less than 20 years and he's arguing against it 7 and 8 um there, for there are three that testify the spirit and the water and the blood the three are in agreement three testify concerning Jesus who he is, what he's done Deuteronomy 19.15 says a single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any sin or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. Our own laws say you can't put somebody in jail because of one witness. It has to be at least two witnesses. You know where our laws are based off of, don't you? The B-I-B-L-E. People might argue that. So, there are three witnesses. John says there's the Holy Spirit testifies. There's water, baptism, a symbolic cleansing as of sin that John was doing. It was a part of the Jewish custom what John was doing, water baptism, to kind of a, a purification to where people say, you know what, I've been sinning. I need to be cleansed, to be purified. And so they would, you know, John's down there, come on down. And he would say, repent. <laughs> repent means change your direction and agree with God. And so he was convicting people, and they were being purified, cleansed, or whatever was next. And essentially, when we baptize somebody, it's kind of the same thing. It's a, a restart, you could say, or where we're saying we're born again because we've been cleansed, washed. And the third is the blood. Jesus shed his blood with the thorns, the scourging, and on the cross. He entered the tabernacle of God in heaven to be the propitiation to appease the wrath of God for all who believe. All three are in agreement concerning Christ. Do you agree or do you disagree? Right, good. I don't have any arguments tonight. All right, he's looking for us. Uh, 9 and 10. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his son. The one who believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him, God, a liar because he's not believed in the testimony of that God has given concerning his son. All right, so who has the greater testimony, God or man? And 
why? Who has a greater testimony? Why? He's omnipotent. Omnipotent. He's the creator. He's all knowing. And we are little and don't and don't know as much as we think we do, right? <laughs> uh, so what is God testified about? What does he say in that verse? That verse is, what's he testified about? His son. His son. When Jesus was baptized, what did they hear said from above? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. There are other kinds, you know. God speaks. This is his son. Prophets, years, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, prophesied the son of God, Messiah, was going to come. And this is what was going to take place. So God has testified about his son. So he says the one who believes in the son, a born-again believer, has testified testimony in himself. So how is that true? How I'm a born again believer. How do I have the testimony in me about Jesus? We have the Spirit in you. Got the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit who testifies in me. How did I know to place my faith in Jesus? Did I just have this bright idea one day and say, you know, I think I won't become a Christian? We have to hear the word, and God's the one who's calling us. He might use one of you to call somebody. I mean, I, I've been in, I've been in restrooms and people put tracks there. Some people pick them up and read it. Well, how? Where are they hearing it from? Or where do they read it? The word of God. It, it's never a matter of somebody going, you know. I think it'd be a pretty good idea if I become a Christian. God calls us. He's calling all human beings in the world to him, I believe, from the moment they're born. Do they all listen? No. If they did, there'd only be one religion in the world, Christianity. That's not the case. Um, John 16, 7 and 8. It says, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. This is Jesus talking. For if I do not go away, the Helper, referring to the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Is the Holy Spirit convicting the world today of sin, righteousness, and judgment? Yes? No. Yes. Are people paying attention? Yeah, some are, but the most, I would say, are not. And I would say most because Islam, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, Buddhism, uh, there's Shintoism, there's Lord knows what ism that are out there that are belief systems that people are 100% into. But God still calls them out. God still calls them out. That's why we got missionaries, some that we're supporting, know the parts of the world they're sharing the gospel uh, John 16 14 this is a new living translation it says he will bring me glory by telling testifying to you whatever he receives from me so it's Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit he will bring glory to Jesus by testifying to us whatever he receives from Christ how do we hear about Christ? Well, we read. But the Holy Spirit is what push, pushes or gives us that urge to read. The Holy Spirit is what will help us understand a passage. You ever read a passage, all this, say, six times? And the first five times you scratch your head, you move on, and six times the light bulb goes on? Or maybe you're like me, it takes about 60 times, and then the light bulb goes on? You know, the Holy Spirit will reveal to us when we need it. When we need it. Now John adds, the one who does not believe God has made God a liar because he has not believed God sent his only begotten son, Jesus, into the world. In the flesh. Again, if 
like Gnosticism. Gnostics said Jesus came only in the spirit. So if somebody says, oh, he only came in the spirit, not in the flesh, you're calling God a liar. Matthew 10, 33. Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. You ever denied Jesus? Bet you have. I know I have. The thing that we have is, God, I messed up. Forgive me. God says, forgiven and forgotten. It's those who continue to deny. Titus 1.16, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable, disobedient, and worthless for any good deed. Oops. They profess to know God, but they don't live life like they know God. Know anybody like it? Don't, I don't need to know. <laughs> there is only one unforgivable sin. You know what it is? To deny the Holy Spirit. Mark 3, 28, 30. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes, which is to speak against, curse, swear, against, oppose the Holy Spirit, never has forgiveness. But this is but is guilty of an eternal sin. Why is that the unforgivable sin? To go against the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit can never enter in you. Who calls us to God? To Christ. So if you oppose or deny the Holy Spirit, are you going to get saved? Are you going to become born again? That's the only unforgivable sin. Make sense? Makes sense, but I've always heard deny God was the unforgivable sin. Well, that's, yes. Yeah. You're denying God. You're denying the Holy Spirit. You don't believe. That's the unforgivable sin, to deny God, to deny the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Holy Spirit that is calling us to God, to accept Christ. But you say, I'm not going to listen. How long ago? Um, not long ago. I've read mission stories, talked to some of the missionaries, you know, come here, uh, email them, whatever. And I've read stories, you know, somebody in, in a Muslim country. They don't feel right about the religion. It doesn't make sense. So they start searching. They find Jesus. You know, but they need to be discipled. Well, they start praying. Lord, send me somebody to help me understand. Boom! It might be a few years. Missionary comes. See, that's, that's how God works. I believe it because I've read and, and heard too many stories of how God works that way. The Holy Spirit calls. Wherever and whoever. Verse 11 and 12. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. All right, John, again, bold but truthful statement. This is the New Living Translation. Again, this is kind of a, an easy read help us understand it. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son, God's Son, does not have life. What does John mean? Has the Son, has life, does not have the Son, does not have life. What does it mean? Maybe lost or saved. Maybe lost or saved. Lost or saved? Okay. Anybody else? As believers, we have eternal life. Right. We've got to believe Jesus. Our sins. And that's how we get eternal life. So if you have Jesus, belief in him, you have life. If you don't, you have the alternative. And it's not life in heaven anyway. John wrote uh, his letter to believers who were faced with false teachings, 
concerning Christ, Gnostics and false teachers had crept into the church and the lives of the believers. The main lie they taught was that Jesus was in spirit form, not in flesh. They gave convincing arguments and drew a lot of Christians onto their side. If this was true, Jesus was in spirit only, then no blood was shed for Jesus or by Jesus. Hence, our sins have not been paid for. An incident in the scripture where believers were being taught false teachings about Christ and salvation is found in Acts chapter 15. Jewish believers came up from Jerusalem to Antioch and convincingly taught, or I should say deceived, believers there. And that's where Paul and Barnabas were. And they were teaching the church there. And they said, unless you're circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So they were adding to the gospel. Well, that's what these Gnostics and other false teachers are doing. They're adding to the gospel, or they're taking away from the gospel. They're changing it. Well, it takes a hair to change by, and it's not the original. It's not the truth. It's their truth. So what do we need to do to be saved? Believe in Christ. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. Uh, in his closing remarks, John presents five statements that every believer can know and be certain of that Christianity is not uh, 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 an I hope so faith or I think so faith, but I know so. First one is, I know that we can have eternal life. Verse 13. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Not gaining it. It's down the road, but you have eternal life. So here we have why John wrote his letter and he's writing to say what they are to know. Not guess at, not hope for. Uh, he wrote to those who are believe in the name of the Son of God, that be us, and that they are to know they have eternal life. Know it. Be positive. No doubts. 14 through uh, 17. This is the second no, is we can know God answers prayers. So look at verse uh, 14, if I can find it. This is a confidence which we have before him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know we have the request which we have asked from him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, uh, he shall ask and God will, he shall ask God will for him to give life. Wait a minute, I'll miss something here. Back up, 15. We know that he hears us in whatever we ask, and we know that we have the request which he has, which we have asked from him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make a prayer request for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. All right. All believers can be confident that God hears their prayers and will answer them so long as we do what? Seek God's will. Mm. Partly right. You seek his will, but you ask according to his will. Just word, wording. So if I say, okay, God, uh, I want a brand new Mercedes Benz. It's his will. <laughs> Good for you. Will it be his will? You know, and somebody brings me a... Don't get it. Somebody brings me a 10-year-old... 300,000 uh, Volkswagen Beetle, I get the car, right? Yeah, that's what happened this week. But it's not what I want. 
God's will is, I need a new car or another car, but it may not be exactly what I want. You know, we get angry. God, that person cut me off. May they be in an accident. Is that asking according to God's will? Probably not. God will take care of them one way or the other. They might meet their maker sooner than later like that. So how does a believer know what God's will is so he can ask accordingly? How do we know what God's will is? His word. Read his word. Pray. Fellowship with other believers. And listen. You know, prayer is a two-way street. It's never meant to be, okay, God, here's my prayer list, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay, in Jesus' name, amen. Stop and listen. Read his word and listen. Take a deep breath. Yes, God. Uh, what, are some, what are some things that we are not to ask God, and what are some things we can ask God for according to his will? So what are some things we are not to ask for? Well, come on, let's just pop Riches. Up. Riches. There you go. Wealth. What else? Man, y'all sleep? Y'all out there? I would say selfish desires. Possessions, power. So what are some things we are to ask for? Wisdom. Wisdom, godly wisdom, not earthly wisdom. There's a difference. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Healing. Say again. Healing. Healing, sure. Meet our needs. Not our wants. Guidance. How about salvation for somebody else? Yes. That's what God's will. In verses 16 and 17, John speaks about a sin leading to death. I believe John is speaking about spiritual death, not physical. First, he speaks about a brother, believer, committing sin. We are to pray. We're to ask God for the restoration. All believers are believers. Nothing can take away their salvation. However, believers can and will sin. This is an example of prayer. Asking according to God's will. Lord, restore my brother, forgive my brother, bring them back into the fold. Next, John speaks about sin that leads to death. And it appears he's speaking about non-believers. Those who have made the choice to not accept Christ as Lord and Savior. They are not brothers of Christ. John does not command to pray, nor does he to not pray. His point is, there are those who refuse to accept Christ, and their sin may be a specifically dead sin, such as driving down the highway at 150 miles an hour. That would be a deadly sin, that wouldn't it? Or blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, denial of the Holy Spirit or that of rejecting the gospel and rejecting Christ. These are sins that lead to spiritual death, separation from God forever. Yes, we can and we should pray for their salvation, but we should pray for the believers who've gone astray more so. Keep the body together. How much more am I going to do much? Let's stop there and we'll pick it up at uh, verse 18 next week. That way I uh, don't find myself talking too fast. Any questions before we get into our prayer time that uh, anybody might have about anything that was discussed? And I appreciate all y'all who...